You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRTLP, 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, November 17th, 2020. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yellow County during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a matter of fact, I started this show eight months to the day, March 17th, and here we are still going strong. I did take a short break while I was busy dealing with election programming here at Davis Media Access, and in that short time frame, COVID numbers have continued to spiral upward. By the numbers, and these are of yesterday. Nationwide, we've crossed the 11 million mark in cases and nearly 250,000 deaths. In California, we're over 1 million cases and over 18,000 deaths. And in Yolo County, we're approaching the 4,000 mark on cases with 70 deaths. Effective today, November 17th, Yolo County has been officially moved back to the more restrictive purple or widespread tier after the California Department of Public Health announced changes to its blueprint framework yesterday. Due to rising cases statewide, CDPH is pulling the emergency break and requiring counties to move backward after only one week of meeting a more restrictive tiers metric instead of the usual two weeks they use. And Yolo County also experienced an outbreak this week at the Riverbend Nursing Facility in West Sacramento. Locally, our adjusted case rate in the county uh, is 17.4, which is well above the purple tier threshold of 7%. Yellow County's not alone. The move impacts roughly three quarters of California's 58 counties. Nearby Solano, Placer, and Napa counties are also affected. So what that means is a return to the purple tier drastically impacts many local businesses that will now have to close indoor business operations or reduce capacity. Effective today, the following businesses will be open outdoors only and with modifications. Family entertainment centers, gyms and fitness centers, movie theaters, museums, zoos and aquariums, places of worship and restaurants. And retail and shopping centers may be open indoors but with a maximum of 25% occupancy. And then further, personal care services, nail salons, hair salons, and barbershops can still remain open indoors with modifications in the purple tier. Um, But let's just say they're highly modified, modified, lots of distancing, lots of space between appointments, and they must follow the state's industry guidance. Any schools that have reopened for in-person or hybrid learning while Yellow County was in the red tier or with an approved waiver are not required to close and can remain open. Schools that have not yet opened will need to receive a waiver to reopen under the purple tier or wait until Yellow County has moved back into the red tier. I'm going to be talking to uh, educators in the weeks ahead, and, you know, that's, that's one of the hardest hit areas is schools. Frankly, this is really hard news as we approach the holidays and experience the onset of our cold and rainy season, and I know we just want this all to be done, but it's not unexpected and caution is justified. Uh, It's not just the death metrics that matter. For one, that metric does not account for the long-term deleterious effects reported by many survivors. And with such heavy case numbers, we need to act now to slow the spread of coronavirus, or we may soon find our local hospitals, like those in other parts of the country, completely overwhelmed. So the advice remains, don't gather. If you gather, do it in a small way, outside, with your pod. Stay home if you have symptoms of illness or high risk. And wear a face covering. Keep your distance, wash your hands. For more information about Yellow County's roadmap to recovery and to see which businesses are currently open, visit yellowcounty.org. All the COVID information is spotlighted on the front page. And we are gonna be back in just a moment with our first interview. Lorraine Nail Vischer is president of the Davis School Arts Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit that believes arts and cultural education is crucial to the development of all children. DSAF provides partnership and support of culturally relevant arts education for children in the Davis Public Schools through a variety of means that we are going to talk about. Welcome, Lorraine. Thanks for joining me. 
You bet. I'm happy to be here, Autumn. Thanks for inviting me. You bet. Um, so you have been involved with the foundation for, for some time. Let's start with when and how did Davis School Arts Foundation start? Well, the Davis School Arts Foundation began with Proposition 13 uh, and the change in the property taxes several years ago, about almost 40 years ago to be exact. And it was a response by our Davis community to help our schools who lost a great deal of funding. Um, and what was particularly suffering and was noticed was the arts in our schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was formed uh, then by a group of teachers, finally uh, was made more official and more effective by Patricia Hirsch Hirschberger, mm -hmm. um, and a, um, a sort of an endowment was creative, created for the foundation, which we have and protect and draw from in addition to uh, donations to fund grants in the schools every year. We've been doing that for almost 40 years. Right. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, many schools across the state lack enrichment programs for things like arts and music, and that's really ne not the case in Davis. That's in part, large part, um, thanks to things like parcel taxes and also organizations uh, like your that's foundation. Correct. So. Talk to me a bit more about your mission. What do you mean by culturally relevant arts education? Well, one of the things that, that the Davis Arts Foundation has noticed in recent years um, is that in art education, a lot of it was kind of turning towards, um, you know, artsy crafts, um, simple art projects, and we wanted to see things brought in that were more culturally relevant mm -hmm. to all people everywhere, not just in Davis, but in, in throughout the greater community and the world that the children of Davis are likely to come in contact with uh, in their lifetimes. And so we wanted to bring in more indigenous cultures, uh, more of the Hispanic culture, and uh, we've done some of that with our grants, and it's something we want to bring in more to encourage uh, a broader worldview, especially in these times when there's so much divisiveness in our world. Mm -hmm. So in normal, that is non-COVID times, mm -hmm. what do sure. your grants uh, to the school district look like and what kinds of things do they help fund? Sure. In the past, uh, the Davis School Arts Foundation has given a site grant to every school um, where the principals are allowed to use that amount uh, to fund activities of their choice or in, in cooperation with teachers. Mm -hmm. Teachers can apply for individual classroom grants or multiple classroom grants. They sometimes use that to do art projects of their own that they create. They sometimes use it to bring, bring in artists in the community to do projects with the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, we also provide funding for elementary school choirs hmm. to encourage choirs uh, at the elementary level, which is not funded by the district. And um, that is funded by what we call our Brunel uh, grants, which are in honor of uh, Brunel, who the Brunel Performing Arts Center is named for at the high school. Mm -hmm. um, we also provide um, grants to uh, some of the high school programs and the junior high programs and the music and the orchestras. So there's a pretty big variety. Um, however, those grants are relatively small. And one of the things that DSAF is looking at right now, in fact, right before COVID, uh, we were working on a strategic plan to start changing our process a bit and uh, meeting our new uh, mission statement, which you uh, are familiar with mm -hmm. and which the cultural um, awareness comes from, um, we, we'd like to see ourselves being able to expand those grants. We'd like to be able to give bigger grants, to uh, provide more direction for teachers on how those grants can be used, and really uh, reach out more. And that's something we were just moving to when COVID hit. Uh, we've had to slow down yeah. on our plans, uh, but, but that is still our goal uh, because yeah. in the past the grants have been relatively small. And, and that's a familiar story too, having plans and having them scuttled or sure. needing, needing to pivot, needing to slow down. I mean, mm -hmm. f for example, I know that in, again, in normal years, we have the wonderful uh, Davis Music Festival, and right. they've made a lot of generous donations to the Davis Absolutely. School Arts Foundation. So absent the ability of fundraisers and festivals to happen, that, that trickles down and, and impacts them. Um, 
nonprofits. Yes, it can, does. Yeah, we all know this. So uh, again, um, in normal times, how how else would you usually um, raise money that that uh, help feed these grants that you give to schools? Yeah. Well, we've been very, very grateful. As you've mentioned, the Davis Music Fest, that was a, an event that was funding us. Um, the uh, Watermelon Music has been a wonderful supporter. Um, they're a fab- fabulous supporting to us. Um, and uh, they still donate every year. And they intend to be supportive of us this year, and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, we have private donors who give give um, some, some of the businesses around town donate uh, to us. And individual donors are mm-hmm. really important to us. Uh, we have a regular donation uh, area on our website. We encourage people to donate. Um, and we participate in the Big Day of Giving mm-hmm. for donations. Uh, and we also, uh, the Home for the Holidays concert has always uh, been uh, a fundraiser for us. And I'm really excited because Bill Fairfield is going to be producing that as you know, because it's going to be on K-Dirt, um, <laughs> we'll be doing the online production of Home for the Holidays this year. And although there won't be tickets sold, they, that will be, again, asking donations towards DSAF. So it's a real variety of places that it comes from, um, and it changes uh, yeah. over time. But uh, we rely heavily on those donations. And then, as I say, we have an endowment that we can draw from. Uh, based on the gains that we have from our investments, but those are small, and yeah. we, we do rely more on uh, the donations. Yeah, and as you know, the work of nonprofits is, is so often comes down to fundraising, so we can keep doing the good work we it do. It does. Um, yes, let me give does. two bits of information here. Let's give the website, uh, davisschoolartsfoundation.org. That's correct. Yes. That's where you can uh, learn more, support, and do all that good stuff. And because you mentioned the Home for the Holidays uh, concert, always a wonderful event, virtual this year on December 17th. And yes, KDRT and Davis Media Access are thrilled that we can help support that effort um, this yeah. year. All right. You have announced a significant pivot for what you're doing this year. Yes. Let's, uh, mm-hmm. let's talk about... The, uh, the art kits, the collaboration you have going there, and how that's going to work. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this, and so is, so is Stacy Ferricks at the Art Center. Mm-hmm. Um, they reached out to us about this project. We agreed to work with them, and, um, you know, given when, when we started looking at our grants this year, we were simply going to divide the money between all the schools this year is what we had decided to do. But then we began to look at that and feel that in our, in our new mission and our new direction, and our, our desire for more equity in the classrooms and more cultural relevance, um, we really wanted to do something different, and the art kit hit the, hit the mark. Yeah. It, um, we're really excited because it isn't another burden for teachers. It's not something added to their workload. It's something to help them. Mm, that's it's important. Not something, uh, it's not something to make things harder for the kids, but to give them more joy and more pleasure and something they can do on their own time and not attached to a screen. Um, it's going to be very culturally diverse. There's lots of different lessons. Um, Stacy and her crew are doing a great job of working with um, other teachers and getting information about the curriculum. And we're targeting fifth grade. Mm-hmm. We're targeting approximately somewhere between 750 to 800 kids who are going to get these art kits that will be full of wonderful art materials and lessons on what to do with them. Uh, the teachers will get the kits as well. So will all the science teachers for those kids. And they can be used independently. They can be used in connection with the lesson. Um, they can be used whether our schools are in session uh, online or whether they are able to get back into the classroom. So they provide a lot of flexibility. Okay, so, so we're really excited about it. So why fifth graders? Well, because that's kind of an in-between year. Mm-hmm. It's, it's uh, you know, the, the elementary school kids, um, it's a different developmental level. Their, uh, their small motor coordination and the direct instruction they need uh, is, is greater uh, in some ways, and their ability to work independently is less. Mm-hmm. Um, and for you get in, into the upper grades, it becomes a little more complicated. Fifth grade is a nice independent mm-hmm. age level. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in the curriculum that can incorporate art. And uh, so we decided that was the best place to focus our, our 10th 
attention at this time. We'd love to expand it. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the means to do that this year unless we get more donations. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so what's in the kits? Oh, gosh, there's going to be, well, I, I just spoke with, with Stacey Ferrick, uh, who's the uh, director of the Art Center mm-hmm. yesterday, and she was explaining, you know, there's going to be watercolors, there's going to be uh, color uh, chalk pastels, there's going to be uh, some unusual items as well. She didn't wasn't too explicit about what those would be, but they might inc- <laughs> include things like foil. Uh, there will probably be scissors and glues and all kinds of different materials that the kids can use. And the nice thing is the lessons will be set up so that uh, the watercolors might be used for one lesson, and then in some other lesson they might be used in a different way. Hmm. So it's not only using the materials, not just using the materials once, but showing them different ways of using them as well, cool. which is really nice. Do you need to apply to get one if you are a family with a fifth grader? No, you don't. They will be given automatically to every fifth grader in the district. Um, they will be provided through the drop-off points where kids are picking up their materials for online uh, schooling right now. And uh, we are still working out the details around that, but we, we hope to roll them out around January 11th. Okay. Um, hope to get them to the teachers before that so they can see what's in there and then roll them out to the kids around January 11th. Now, this is a wonderful effort, Lorraine. I'm just kind of bummed you have to be a fifth grader. I mean, I kind of want one now. <laughs> I know what you mean. Me too. <laughs> All right. Um, so so beyond this effort, which sounds like it's going to be a pretty heavy lift uh, in, mm-hmm. in January, um, what, what can you, in the last couple minutes we have, what can you envision as coming next for Davis School Arts Foundation? You've mentioned, you know, wanting to, you have a new mission statement. You've mentioned wanting to um, expand. Any idea what that might look like? Sure. Sure. I, I see it looking as more collaboration with other groups like the Davis Art Center. Um, I see it including continued collaboration with the Davis Art Center and with the school district. That, you know, if we want to, to do more uh, and on a bigger scale, then we have to work with others. It's mm-hmm. not possible to do it alone. And it isn't, it isn't practical. It isn't sustainable. And um, so I see us doing a lot more of that. Um, I'd like to see us having more of the community involved with us directly um, and not necessarily having to serve on our board of directors, but being volunteers who come and engage with us and work with us on specific projects. I see that happening in the future. Uh, I'd like to see our donor base increasing so that we um, can uh, count on more donations on a regular basis from a, a, a pool of donors that we can look towards. So those are all things I'd like to, and directions I'd like to see us going. Great. Well, you have been providing leadership, as I said earlier, for some time. I know you're a former teacher. I know you're a singer. <laughs> you're, you know, you're deeply involved in our community. So thank you for the good work you do. And uh, again, thanks for joining me today. And you're I want to so just welcome. give the website one more time, uh, davisschoolartsfoundation.org. There are two S's in there, Davis School. Yes, there are. And uh, you can also email question to dsafstudio at gmail.com. Right. And there's a donation page of the website, and <laughs> I look at every email and answer them personally, so I'll be watching. All right. Thanks so much, Lorraine. Take good care. Thank you, Autumn. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. We're going to be back in just a couple of seconds here. I had to pre-record my second interview because my guest is 14 and is in school at the moment. Be right back. My next guest is a 14-year-old who lives in Davis and is a ninth grader at Da Vinci Junior High. He was poised to start a new venture just as the pandemic struck. Here to give us a little insight into his world and what he's up to these days is Rohan Bakshi. Rohan, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Autumn. So right before the pandemic struck, you got trained as a DJ here at KDRT. And then what happened? Um, so I got training from KDRT and um, because I want to start my own radio show um, because uh, to give you a little um, backstory, I, um, a couple years ago, my dad gave me a handheld radio. Mm-hmm. So um, I would use this when I was like bored or had nothing to do. And um, I just got hooked because um, 
I just like really like was stuck to my radio. I'd listen to sports and sports news and um, music. And this just led me to want to start my own radio show because I was, I got inspired by the people I would listen to on the radio who would share their experiences and want to share their passion with others. So I want to do the same. I want to share what I love with others. Right. So you, you went ahead and you started a show. It's called Time Out Radio and uh, you've been doing it from home. So tell us how you put a show together each week or every other week. Yeah. So um, first, when I first started my uh, Time Out Radio, I had to first learn technology and the radio production pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been using Audacity to record and edit my show. And I've been additionally using Zoom to interview my guests. And I get my guests from either people that I've known from past experiences, or I've read like either in the news somewhere. And Mm -hmm. I think that if some that guest would be a good person to have on or and sh- share um, their information about either their organization or their experiences. I get their contact information and I ask them uh, to be a guest on my show. Mm-hmm. And um, the show theme, each um, show has a theme and that's based on where the interview leads us. So if there's the interviewee tells where they're from or where their organization is held, then we um, have a place of the week, which we visit a city that either, as I mentioned, where the organization is from or where they are from, Mm -hmm. we um, get to know a little bit about that city and what is, what's like interesting there. Um, So that's basically how our our radio show works. And additionally, there's, um, we have like a wild card segment, which either is about, um, since I love sports so much, I either give a sports update Mm -hmm. or I um, give a little history or fun facts about something to do with the interview. So that's a little bit about how a show on Time Out Radio goes. Right. And in normal times, you'd be coming into KDRT to Davis Media Access to record the show, but you just kind of went ahead and figured it out at home, maybe with a little help and, and you're making it happen, which is cool. You also did another really cool thing. Tell us briefly about the pitch contest for Points of Light Foundation. Yeah, so um, Points of Light is a national foundation that helps promote community engagement around the country. So there were points of light held a pitch contest this past summer for youth and teens would submit proposals that would help schools in their community adjust to the new normal of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I submitted a 90 second pitch video and a written proposal as well, which uh, to bring in voices of youth teachers and coaches and additionally community organizations to Time Out Radio to basically overcome challenges of social distancing. So Time Out Radio will use these funds for um, additional radio training, equipment, and promotion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really worth mentioning, you were one of 10 finalists or 10 winners of the pitch contest nationwide, Not, not just in California, not just in one area, but nationwide. So hats off to you for that. Yeah, thanks. We also want to hear a little bit about just what it's like to be a 14-year-old these days. I I know because you talk about this on your show, the things you love are are sports and travel and music. And a lot of those are, you know, they're kind of hard to do during a pandemic. Um, And you're you're a ninth grader and you're doing distance learning. You're uh, at home. So are there good things about that or is it just really challenging? Well, the new normal is like, strange to say the least you know not everyone's like not used to you know being with your friends all the time and uh what's been challenging for me the most is doing school on a screen because you're just staring at a screen for half uh like half a day and it's just couldn't sometimes be hard to concentrate and be organized that was the hardest for me back in spring when um the COVID-19 restrictions started um we started school in April and Mm -hmm. that was really a stressful time to me because I wasn't used to this and it was just really hard to, you know, get organized. But um, now that we start school again in September, it was a lot easier for me because one, the structure was different Mm -hmm. and the teachers had an idea of, you know, what it's going to look like. And two, I just had the, you know, idea of what things are going to be. And while it is sometimes stressful, I feel like this is the safest thing and that the teachers are doing what's safe for them and the kids. 
Absolutely. I, you know, and I think your generation is going to walk away from this experience with just a radically different perspective than generations that that came before you. We we haven't lived through this in the same way that you're living it right now. And I think it's going to change who you are and what you decide to do in the world and what kind of change you decide to make. So before we run out of time, I know that you recently put out a call uh, for people who would like to be interviewed or guest on your show, and you, you've really interviewed a wide variety of folks. So let's make sure we tell people where they can find that information and how they can reach you. Yeah, so um, for anyone in the community who wants to recommend a guest for Time Out Radio to interview, you can go to Time Out Radio's website on KDRT's webpage um, and go to programs and select Time Out Radio's program. And in the description, there will be a, a link to a form. And that form will lead you to um, a, a survey of questions, getting the guest contact information, why you chose them. And so um, Time Out Radio will use that and get uh, guests and of all sorts of backgrounds. And to reach Time Out Radio, make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date. Great. Thanks so much for sharing a, a little insight into how you put your show together. We appreciate it, Rohan. Take good care. Yep. Thank you so much. All right. That was the wonderful Rohan Bakshi, our 14-year-old radio host of Time Out Radio here on KDRT. Thanks for tuning in. You have been listening to the COVID-19 Community Report live from the KDRT studio Tuesday, November 17th. See you next week.